Welcome everybody to another lecture of the Elements of Sustainability series. Today we have Professor Jeremiah Johnson presenting on life cycle assessment. Dr. Johnson is an associate professor at North Carolina State University's Department of Civil, Construction and Environmental Engineering and part of, of the Chancellor's Faculty Excellence Program in Sustainability Energy Systems and Policy. His research uses systems methods to evaluate the environmental impacts of changes to their power systems, including those driven by technology. Jeremiah, thank you for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Erica, and thank you for this opportunity to share, uh, to share with the audience the opportunities to reduce environmental impacts using life cycle assessment. I'm really excited to be a part of this Dow Elements of Sustainability series and uh, hope that the, the audience finds learning about life cycle assessment useful in their in their day to day practice. Uh, so a little bit of context, and I'm sure that all the speakers will will touch on this. But what is sustainability? And the, the most common definition that we hear is the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So there are a few a few key points implicit in that. There are this, there's this idea that uh, we need to meet our needs and that that the uh, the economy must serve people without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their their own needs. And so implicit in this is this idea of the triple bottom line that we we need to focus on the economy, on society, and on environment. That environment can be a limiting factor in meeting those needs today and tomorrow. And it's that that third category, that third bubble where life cycle assessment comes into play. Uh, so sustainability focuses on all three, while environmental sustainability can use life cycle assessment to understand those environmental impacts. So a tool to quantify those environmental impacts across life cycles. Uh, so what do we mean by that? Well, here's a question that is easy to ask, but quite difficult to answer. Uh, which car is better for the environment, an internal combustion engine vehicle or an electric vehicle. We're seeing rather quick growth and interest in, in electric vehicles. And uh, this question is really important as we as we change our primary modes of trans transportation or potentially change our primary mode of transportation from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles. How do we understand the environmental impact? Simply stated, which car is better for the environment. And so in that question, a lot of questions immediately follow. First and foremost, what do we mean by better for the environment? Uh, that's a, a very far reaching term. And when, when push comes to shove, when we're trying to quantify this, uh, we need to be able to articulate that a little bit better. Simply saying which car is better for the environment doesn't tell us what we mean, which aspects of environmental performance are we talking about? Uh, what is the scope? So how, how broadly are we looking at this question? Who is asking and why are they asking? Do we have a car manufacturer that is asking perhaps to, uh, to promote a, a car that is newly under development? Do we have a consumer asking, trying to make a responsible choice, do something that will reduce environmental impacts, improve environmental outcomes? How are the vehicles used? So we see two vehicles in this picture right here, uh, but how they are used could vary widely and how they are used can really drive the answer to that question, which is better for the environment. Where are the cars used? If you plug that electric vehicle in one location versus another, the answer to your question will be quite different. What are their fuel efficiencies? So how efficient does the internal combustion engine vehicle use gasoline or diesel? How efficient does the electric vehicle use its battery charge? What are the material inventories? What is the collection of materials that go to make these vehicles? And what are their production processes? So for the, for the car manufacturer, what are they doing within their factory walls? Uh, how do they make these vehicles? Uh, so we started with what was a deceptively simple question, which car is better for the environment? I quickly followed with, with a litany of other questions that, that are necessary to, to properly answer that first question. And we can think of many more as well. Uh, so to do this well, to answer that question in a way that 
does proper service to that question, uh, we need to expand the system boundary using life cycle thinking. So if you were an auto manufacturer, your, your, your default way of thinking may be to focus on manufacturing. What is within your factory walls? How can you pr improve production processes? How can you reduce energy consumption within the factory? How can you reduce waste within the factory? And those are valid questions, valid aspirational goals. So improving those production processes. But life cycle thinking and life cycle assessment makes us go beyond those factory walls. There are questions that need to be asked that are outside of the auto manufacturer's purview. For example, the consumer. What is the consumer going to do? How are they going to use this vehicle? How much will they drive it each year? In the case of electric vehicles, where will they plug it in? So that is something that the auto manufacturer doesn't have necessarily have direct control over, but can greatly influence that question of what are the environmental impacts of these vehicles. We can also look in the other direction, our suppliers, looking upstream. Uh, what are the materials that we have chosen to put in these vehicles? How are those materials obtained? Do they contain recycled ma materials in, the, in and of themselves, or are they uh, predominantly primary metals, for example? And going even a, even a level further upstream, where are those metals obtained? And what are the impacts associated with mining? Okay, you can see that the, the system boundary can expand really quickly. And then we can think about end of life. Okay, so after the consumer uses the vehicle and it reaches its natural end of life, uh, what happens to the vehicle? Are there consequences? Are there burdens associated with disposal that are large and relevant and should be included in our study? So how do we think about waste management? And is it a true end of life or can the vehicle be reused? Does that first owner sell it, sell the vehicle to a second owner? Or can parts be used or materials be reused in a way that reduces those upstream burdens, either through remanufacturing or recycling down to our uh, down to our, our base materials. Again, so that system boundary expands rather rapidly, but these are all important questions when you're trying to accurately answer, answer that first question. And so life cycle assessment is the means to do this. Life cycle assessment is a framework for viewing products and systems from cradle to grave or perhaps cradle to cradle, if we think about recycling and reuse, perhaps there doesn't need to be that grave and we can return things to those upstream, upstream unit processes. So a key benefit of adopting this perspective is the creation of a systems thinking view that is broadly encompassing and can be analyzed with existing methods. LCA in and of itself is not mathematically difficult. The, it's, it's really accounting of materials, energy flows, and emissions. The, the challenge, and one of the key challenges, is setting that system boundary correctly. How far do we need to reach up the supply chain? And how do we think about our consumers and the disposal at end of life? And taking that systems view allows us to not miss, not miss the forest for the trees. When life cycle perspectives have not been used, we can often see unexpected environmental impacts, uh, some that may have been anticipated with that broader View. So tying this back to that automotive example, uh, perhaps the automotive manufacturer did, did a tremendous job of improving efficiency, reducing waste within the factory walls, but they're producing a really inefficient vehicle, a, a very low, low MPG vehicle, miles per gallon vehicle. Uh, and the, the uh, benefits gained within the factory walls are lost rather quickly during the use phase. And life cycle assessment offers a means to understand those things that may not be within your direct vision. So narrow system boundaries can hinder those insights and lead to adverse impacts. If you only focus on one life stage, you might not see, see where the true impacts lie. So proper life cycle assessments adhere to ISO standards. Uh, there are proper protocols, proper methods to follow to be a true LCA. And so the ISO standards, the International Organization for Standardization has documents that lay out what those methods are and what those standards that must be followed are. And we'll go through those really quickly. We'll, we'll keep this simple, but uh, one of the, the most important standards is ISO 14040, released in 2006. And the, this figure right here summarizes the approach that must be followed. So on the left, we see the life cycle assessment framework. Uh, starting with a goal and scope definition. So why are we why are we doing this LCA and what is the scope that we are including within this LCA? 
Then the inventory analysis, so collection of data uh, as related to material flows, energy use, and emissions. We then have impact assessment, so we're turning that inventory into environmental impacts. And we'll talk a little bit more about each of these life stages in, in the coming slides. But one thing that's also really important is this interpretation phase. So LCA is by its very nature an iterative process. Uh, we don't know what the results are going to show. We don't know which life stages are going to dominate entering. We might have, our, we might have um, good informed uh, guesses, but we don't know until we actually collect some data and we, we analyze that data. And so along each stage, we can revisit the goal and scope. We can revisit the inventory and focus on those inventory items that are dominating impacts. We can look at the impact assessment and perhaps we're finding a certain uh, type of impact is dominating our results. And so we can revisit and improve analysis as we go along. And that happens at each of these steps in the LCA framework. So let's take a moment and, and, and visit what I mean when I say goal and scope definition. So a proper LCA uh, must have a goal that includes these four items. The intended application, so why are you doing this study, the reasons for carrying out the study, the audience, and whether the results will be used in comparative assertions released publicly. So examples of common applications. So if you are a company looking to use LCA to reduce your environmental impact, you might conduct what's called a hot spot analysis. You want to see where the highest impacts lie, either within your factory walls, within your supply chain, and, and target those effectively low-hanging fruit first. So where are the, the risk zones? Where are the, the high-impact processes or parts of your system boundary? Also, another very common application is a product or process comparison. So that's what we're seeing with this comparison of the internal combustion vehicle versus the electric vehicle. How do we stack up? compared to a product or a process that serves a similar purpose. So let me give you an example of a, an ISO compliant goal statement for LCA. So we are an auto manufacturer conducting a comparative LCA of an electric vehicle with a gasoline powered automobile for public release. This study may be used internally to reduce environmental impacts of our products and by our marketing team, which may use the results to inform customers. So we look, each of those four elements are included. The intended application, a comparative LCA of these two vehicles. Why are we carrying out the study? Uh, we want to reduce environmental impacts of our products, so that's an internally focused goal, internally focused reason for carrying out the study, as well as an externally focused goal. We believe that we can inform consumers and consumers who care about environmental impacts of their decisions through marketing. We, we think that that might be a viable reason for carrying out this study. Two audiences, we state, so internally, so our, our, our folks that have the ability to change production processes, as well as our marketing team, which can communicate externally. Uh, and that fourth element, whether these results will be used in comparative assertions released publicly. It is fine if the answer is no. These are, this is an internal document meant for internal decision making. It's also fine if the answer is uh, no, this is going to be an external document for public release. But to be ISO compliant, you need to be candid and upfront about which, which approach that you will be taking. So the goals of the LCA uh, also require coming up with an appropriate functional unit for comparison. Okay, so this is a term that you'll hear a lot with life cycle assessment, functional unit. What are the units of comparison? So in this example, we have two vehicles. Perhaps we could, we could compare per car. What are the environmental impacts per car coming off of the assembly line? Uh, or it could be something else. Um, when might we prefer per car? When might we prefer per passenger mile traveled? Ah, so, so this distinction of using perhaps a more specific functional unit, per passenger mile traveled, raises some really important questions. What if the automobiles uh, had different capacities? What if one was designed to hold uh, on average, three passengers, then the other designed to old, hold only one. They're not providing the same level of service there. And if we can come up with a functional unit that provides a suitable level of comparison per passenger mile traveled, uh, that might allow for a proper apples to apples comparison. So this definition, functional unit, it defines one unit of the service provided. 
and it allows you to compare environmental of environmental performance across disparate products. In this case, the two products are relatively similar. So per passenger mile travel is probably a suitable functional unit. Uh, sometimes we'll get to more complex comparisons and one that require uh, a, a bit more thought and a, and a, a bit more um, deliberation as to what the suitable functional unit is. So let's go through a few examples just to make sure we understand this concept. So if you are at, at your company trying to uh, structure and properly set the goal and scope of an LCA, what is the functional unit? And so here are some different product systems. So we're not comparing these across each other. These are just examples for coming up with a good functional unit. So the first, a coal power plant. What is the function of a coal power plant? It's to generate electricity. So this one perhaps is easy. A, a suitable functional unit here could be one kilowatt hour of electricity generated or could be one kilowatt hour of electricity delivered if you want to consider transmission losses, for example. So that's a, a fairly straightforward product system with a, a fairly obvious functional unit. Okay, the next product system, a, a hand dryer. So we've seen LCAs that compare the environmental impact of using the hand dryer where you, you dry your hand with the blown air versus paper towels. Uh, very different products, very similar function. So the function here could be drying hands and, and look at this, one function unit could be one pair of dried hands. Okay, so I'm sure that is not a, a unit that you have, uh, you have used in any course you've ever taken in, in, uh, at, at university. But if you think about it, that is a suitable unit of comparison. If we're trying to compare an electric hand dryer with paper towels, really your goal is to have dried hands. And so the functional unit there could be one pair or it could be a thousand pair or it could be 10,000 pair of, um, of dried hands. So the functional unit doesn't have to be something that uh, a, a standard SI unit. It could be something a little bit more creative. Uh, for a light bulb, so we've seen many LCAs that compare incandescent light bulbs with compact fluorescent light bulbs with uh, LED lighting. And the function of all of these is providing light. Uh, so the functional unit here should not be 100 watts. Each of those three technologies provides light using different amounts of energy. Some function of of the light that is emitted. So 100 lumens for one hour. So some amount of light provided for some duration of time. And that would allow for a fair comparison between three light bulbs that uh, consume very different amounts of electricity. An airplane, function here transportation and long distance transportation. So again, we might see passenger miles traveled. It's very similar to the car. Uh, here's a tricky one, paint. If we are comparing two brands of paint, say perhaps one that is, is cheaper and you'll need to repaint after three years, one that is more durable, you'll need to repaint after five years, that duration of time is important. So if we think of the function of paint here is to protect the exterior of your house or the exterior of your the walls in your living room, maybe the functional unit here should be years of coverage. So not just coverage, not just the area that the paint can, can cover, but how long it will serve that role. If the function is protecting the exterior, and that cheaper paint lasts three years and the more expensive paint lasts five years, we want to make sure you capture that in the functional unit to give you that apples to apples comparison. Sometimes this can be even trickier than paint. So if we're comparing milk with orange juice with cola, for example, what is the right functional, functional unit there? Uh, food LCAs to date largely have used mass or volume as a basis of comparison. And so if we look at these, these three items, a half gallon of milk, a half gallon of orange juice, or a two liter plastic bottle of cola, uh, we'll see very different kilograms of CO2 equivalent emissions. So this would be the climate change impacts per half gallon. And in this case, the milk performs quite poorly. It has high emissions relative to orange juice and to, and to cola. Uh, but there's something that's not quite satisfying about that. Milk provides other services, provides other functions than, than cola. And, and certainly I have, I have kids and I would much rather they drink uh, a glass of milk than a, than a glass of cola. So how do we think about the proper functional unit here? Well, we could go by calories, but that actually does not change, change the answer very much. The calories in each of those volumes of beverage look quite similar. Uh, we could look at protein. Okay, so if we look at protein, uh, milk provides a lot of protein. So per unit of protein, the impacts change wildly. Uh, we could look at vitamin C. Well, okay, I don't think we're drinking milk or cola to provide vitamin C. Uh, so I, I leave this uh, not with a correct answer, but 
uh, offering up a, a complex and challenging question, uh, one that can uh, be important to address and address thoroughly early in your LCA. What is the function that your product is providing? And if you're comparing it to another product, what is the suitable functional unit for comparison? How do you get to a proper apples to apples comparison? So once you've done that, once you have set a proper goal and scope, once you have defined your functional unit correctly, uh, you can begin with your inventory analysis. And, it, and it's a relatively straightforward task that can require quite a bit of time to collect data. The, the idea behind an inventory analysis, what's in? What are we including? So thinking about these two cars, well, the use phase. I think we need to include the use phase. And so for the internal combustion engine, we need to think about gasoline. But not only do we think about gasoline, we should probably think about the refinery, the refinery that provided us with that gasoline. And not only the refinery, we should probably go upstream one unit further and think about the petroleum extraction itself. Okay, so that's just gasoline. So then we have electricity as well. Think about electricity production. Where are we plugging in that electric vehicle? Is it being charged with electricity produced from coal, from natural gas, from renewables, from nuclear power? Uh, if the answer is, is includes natural gas, do we need to think about natural gas extraction, processing, transport? Do we need to think about methane leakage as we transport that, that natural gas? And if you're like me, the first time I, I saw a study like this and tried to set a system boundary, it immediately becomes very daunting. Where do you draw the lines? How do you stop? Where will I get all of this data? And fortunately, many people have asked questions about these processes before. So you will not be responsible for creating a model related to coal production, creating a model related to natural gas production. Uh, those exist and data sets exist that, that are uh, thoroughly vetted that you can use. It's assembling these and setting the system boundaries correctly so that you can use them well. Other things to include, perhaps maintenance. Do you need to change the oil of the car? Do you need to replace, replace the battery at some point? Uh, how is the vehicle produced? What materials are used? Particularly for the, for the electric vehicle, but also for uh, the internal combustion engine vehicle. How is the battery manufactured and what is it made of? How often do you replace the battery? And what do you do at end of life? And perhaps do you recover any of those materials? Okay, so very quickly we've turned from a simple question to one with a big scope that we have uh, many aspects to include. We have to draw the line somewhere. So what is out? Uh, and this question is um, a challenging one and one that one that you will face coming up with your system boundary. Uh, you'll see here that I did not include the materials necessary to build a coal power plant. I think that's a reasonable assumption. The capital equipment needed to uh, extract natural gas, the refinery itself, so the steel that goes into the refinery. And the logic being here that um, the throughput of these things are so high and what you will use for your automobile is so small that it's probably trivial, but it's always good to test. So, so if you can uh, calculate and, and demonstrate that those impacts on your inventory are small, all the better. And so not only do we have that system boundary, then we go down, go down a level as well. So what are the resources necessary to populate your inventory? How much carbon steel are you using? How much aluminum, copper, glass, polymers, rubber, et cetera, et cetera? What are the production processes to make the body of the automobile, to make the brakes, to make the chassis? In the use phase, how much gasoline will you use? What is a, what are, will your assumptions be for driving patterns, for fuel efficiency, for brake replacement, for tire replacement, and end of life? Does the car go to a shredder and largely get recovered or are there components that must be landfilled? So bringing that detail down even further. So what does this look like, this data collection process? Well, you can have your, your team, your analysts, your engineers track the inventory creation. So what are the raw materials coming into a unit process? What is the energy and in what form coming in to each unit process? What happens in that unit process and what are the emissions? Emissions to the atmosphere, emissions to water, solid waste. What are some co-products? Many production processes do not just produce one thing, they produce multiple products. So how do you treat those coal products? How can you look at the product of focus while still considering the benefits of that co-product? So here's a generalized view of the data that you might collect. Uh, so inputs from the technosphere, inputs from nature, emissions and, and products. I see without fail that, that um, 
this process is difficult and folks uh, often struggle to collect the data. And, and so I would advise a couple of things. Um, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good at this, at this stage. Uh, don't become paralyzed by imperfect data sets. I have never once seen a perfect data set. Uh, you want to collect good quality data. You want to make sure that you are not excluding processes because data are not available. But you also don't want to let a study go on for five years because you don't have the perfect data set. Uh, we will we'll discuss briefly at the end ways to address uncertainty. If you know that you have a soft spot in your data collection, um, when we when we interpret the results, we'll see if that's an important soft spot. See if, see if further data collection is necessary, or perhaps that's trivial to the, the question that you are asking. But if you never get to the, to the interpretation phase, if you never get to look at impacts, uh, you'll never know if it's trivial or non-trivial. So here's just a, a quick snapshot of, of lifecycle inventory data that are available. And this is freely available. So this is uh, pro uh, provided by the US government. The, um, the data set here is for transportation by diesel powered truck. And we see there's a series of outputs. So carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, et cetera, et cetera. And the inputs are diesel uh, to the truck itself. Uh, so this is a, a perhaps a simple example. Uh, if you get into some complex chemicals, you'll see many more outputs, many more inputs. Really, the, this uh, is the heart and soul, the, basic of your, the basics of your data collection. So for each process, what are the inputs and what are the outputs? And for the outputs, where are they going? Are they products? Are they emissions to air? Are they emissions to water? So some databases. So as, as you do this, um, you may choose to hire a consultant who specializes in LCA, but you still want to make sure you can understand the right questions to ask and interpret their results. Or you may choose to do this in-house. This might be something that you have a team or want to build a team that can do this. And, and so some existing databases. No one will ever build an LCA completely from the ground up without relying on some external data. So there's freely available data. So the US LCI database, that was the snapshot that I showed two slides ago. Free, there are over a thousand processes on there, many of the most common ones. A very common database used is EcoInvent. That is proprietary, so you would need a, a, a subscription to that. And it has several thousand processes. And there are others that, are, that uh, focus on, uh, on certain aspects. So the USDA has an LCA Digital Commons for agricultural products and processes. So if the product or process that you're looking has a large agricultural component, uh, there is some free, freely available data through the USDA. And other databases as well. So other both freely available and proprietary databases. So once you have that inventory, once you have collected data on the inputs and the outputs to your system, we need to take that to the next level. The, the inventory in and of itself doesn't tell us about the environmental burdens. We need to do an impact assessment. So we have emissions at our inventory level, impacts, or sometimes called midpoint impacts, and then ultimately damages or endpoints if we choose to go that far. So that first stage, the emissions, gives us our cataloged mass flows or energy flows for our life cycle emissions. Impacts, the midpoint impacts, on the other hand, answer the question of which categories of environmental impacts do we consider? So back to that early question, what do we mean by better for the environment? Better for the environment might mean a lot of different things to different people. And so what are some of those Im midpoint impact categories that we would consider? And so this is just one list of midpoint impact categories. Different studies use different ones. Often we will see climate change as one of the key midpoint impact categories. So if we think about going from going from inventory to impact, okay, there are multiple compounds at, when released to the atmosphere that have a climate change impact. Uh, CO2 is the most common, but methane is very important. And methane actually per unit mass has a bigger impact than CO2. So going from this inventory, where we have a collection of chemicals released to the atmosphere, or to water, or to land, going to impacts, deciding which of those chemicals have an impact on climate change, what that impact factor is, and how we can bring it to a common unit. So instead of saying we have this collection of 1,000 chemicals throughout our life cycle we, we emit, we can say something about our climate change impact. The same thing applies for other impact categories. So for ozone depletion, so this is stratospheric ozone depletion, the, releases, the release of CFCs, 
globally, we've done quite well at reducing those burdens. And so that might be a category that you focus on if your process somewhere in the supply chain has some ozone depleting substances. Uh, we also have acidification. So the idea here, the release of, for example, uh, SOx or NOx to the air from burning coal or natural gas. Downstream, we will have some increased acidification. So this, this little figure here shows the Midwest and the Northeast US several years ago. So this was um, some time ago when uh, high sulfur coal was still being commonly used and not scrubbed. And so acidification is, is another impact category often featured. Eutrophication. So the release often phosphorus or nitrogen into water bodies, when those substances are, are limiting, when those substances, uh, the addition of those substances cause algal growth, for example, we can see things like eutrophication. So this is a, an aerial view of, of Lake Erie uh, experiencing eutrophication. So fertilizer runoff, nitrogen phosphorus reaching, reaching Lake Erie, causing these, this rapid growth of algae having a really adverse uh, ecosystem impacts. So another category, so a water-focused midpoint impact category. We see smog, so ground level smog, ecotoxicity, so damage to ecosystems, uh, or human toxicity, either cancerous or non-cancerous human toxicity impacts. We can talk about resource depletion, so using depletable resources, burning fossil fuels, using metals in a dissipative fashion, so depleting are non-renewable resources. We could include land use as a midpoint impact category. Are we fundamentally changing how land is used? Or water consumption, are we, are we pulling from vulnerable aquifers? Uh, so this is not the list, this is a list of midpoint impact categories. And so based on the study that you would do, uh, based on the questions that you are asking, you may choose a subset of these or you may choose others that I have not, not introduced here. But the idea is to go from this list of this inventory list, this collection of chemicals that we are using and we, and we are releasing, and turning it into something that actually informs impacts, impacts to climate change, impacts to acidification, impacts to water bodies via eutrophication. And there are ways to do this, so you would not be responsible to, to invent the ways to go from inventory to impacts. There are different characterization models. Eco Indicator 99 recipe uh, Tracy. Tracy is the U.S. EPA's method to go from inventory to impact. And we'll see, I'll give an example how we do that here. So climate change, the indicator could be infrared radiative forcing increase. The characterization factor could be global warming potential. And the unit that we want to bring all of our chemicals to, all of our chemicals in our inventory to, would be kilograms of CO2 equivalent to air. Okay, so one kilogram of CO2 would be one kilogram of CO2 equivalent. Uh, one kilogram of methane, however, would be much higher. So if you're using a 100-year time horizon, it would be 25 kilograms of CO2 equivalent. So we're bringing these disparate chemicals to a common unit so we can say one thing about that midpoint impact category. So we can look at the midpoint impact category holistically. Ozone depletion, uh, same method but different indicators, different units. So here we talk, we would bring things to a common unit of CFC 11 equivalents. Terrestrial acidification, you could bring them to kilograms of SO2 equivalent. Freshwater eutrophication, kilograms of phosphorus equivalent, et cetera, et cetera. So we're bringing our, our wide range of inventory to these common units so we can say something about the midpoint impact categories. What you might do at that point, so you'll have some results at that point, and, and you will, um, there'll be large numbers and small numbers, but they perhaps don't carry that much meaning. There's a lot of CO2 versus a little SO2, which is better. They're, they have very different impacts, climate change versus acidification. So what is very common at this stage is to normalize your results to per capita impacts. And this is just a, a snapshot of U.S. normalization factors. So the rightmost column here, we see the per capita impact for different impact categories. And using these normalization factors, uh, we can bring it into units that make a little bit more sense. So if the difference between automobile A and automobile B is the equivalent of 1,000 person equivalents for a category, okay, that sounds big. If it's 0.001 person equivalents, well, that sounds quite small. 
So bringing into more tangible units using normalization factors. And this last stage, not a universally applied step of LCA, but one that can carry additional meaning. So going from those impacts, climate change, eutrophication, etc., to damages. What are the damages associated with those midpoint impacts? So for example, so we have our emissions inventories, our CO2, methane, phosphorus, nitrogen, etc. We have our midpoint impact categories that we just discussed. And we'll see that some are linked to others. And once we connect them all in the ways that they are connected, we'll have some results related to the midpoint indicators. What we may choose to do is to go one step further. What is the human health impact of these different midpoint in indicators? What happens for ozone depletion? What happens for acidification to human health? And a unit we could use there is a disability adjusted life year. Also, ecosystems potentially disappeared for action. So the first is human health impact. The second is ecosystem impact that is not directly related to human health. And a third category we might see is resources surplus costs. So this consumption of uh, depletable resources. So bringing the midpoint indicators to an endpoint indicator. Again, this is not a universally applied step, but it is one that can help you understand competing priorities. Perhaps if you can change a process that will reduce climate change impact, but increase eutrophication impact, is that a good deal? Uh, and, and bringing it to these endpoint indicators can help you reconcile uh, ambiguous, ambiguous answers. Okay, so we've talked a lot about setting the right goal and scope, about collecting data, determining impacts, and then looking at results. Over, overarching to all of this, we need to think about uncertainty and variability. We need to make sure that the results that we, that we produce and the recommendations that we make are robust given, given the approach and the data that we have. And there's a wide range of approaches to uncertainty and variability. And the first, uh, qualitative, a simple review of source quality. Are we collecting primary data that we really trust, uh, or are we using data that is um, of, an un, uh, of an undetermined source or of a poor quality? Uh, moving up, up the ladder, semi-quantitative assessments, so significant heuristics. Uh, this is a very common approach. Before starting an LCA for, for perhaps a comparative study, we may say that we expect the data to be no more certain than to allow us to make claims unless we see differences between product A and product B exceeding 25%. So placing that stake early in the process and then uh, not making broad claims when the results are rather close. A pedigree matrix approach is, a, is an increasing level of sophistication. So what you would do here is turn qualitative aspects of your, of your data sources. Uh, so is it a primary data source? Do you have multiple data sources for a process, et cetera, et cetera? And converting that into a numerical value and calculating confidence around that pedigree matrix. And the highest level of sophistication is, of course, proper confidence intervals. This can be difficult for large projects. And so instead, what we will see far more common is sensitivity analysis. So bounding each parameter within a range that is plausible and testing the sensitivity of, of the final results and your recommendations to that sensitivity. And what you will see without fail is that many of the parameters are, the, the results are insensitive to many of the parameters and highly sensitive to a, a small select few. And when you see this, that, that's a great opportunity to, to return to return to your study, revisit your data source for those small select few and see if you can improve them, see if you need to improve them. But if you don't get to this stage, if you get paralyzed at the data collection stage, you will never know which data points you need to revisit and improve upon. To wrap up, how do we use LCA to make informed decisions? Well, what you'll see is many studies yield results that look like it depends. And in some ways that can be can be unsatisfying, but it's often correct. For example, with our internal combustion vehicle or our electric vehicle, uh, which one has better environmental performance? Well, it depends on how you use them. It depends on where you plug that electric vehicle in. It depends on how many passengers you have riding in, in the cars. Uh, and so those answers, those, those uh, factors that it depends upon are actually, can actually be tremendous leverage points. 
If your goal holistically is to reduce environmental impacts from transportation, perhaps there are locations in, in the US or abroad where targeting electric vehicle adoption would yield better results. Cleaner grids, for example. And so despite situation dependent results and despite uncertainty, LCA can and does offer valuable insights. Uh, for example, with our vehicle LCA, I'm not going to show a lot of, ex a lot of uh, LCA results here, but I will talk about some of the common results that have emerged from multiple LCAs from different research groups. Vehicle LCAs have consistently shown that the majority of impacts or nearly all impact factors occur during use. So if you go back, if you are that, that automobile manufacturer, um, while your production impacts can be important, they're not going to necessarily be dominant. And thinking about what happens after your car leaves the factory gate is. So thinking about the in-use impacts of vehicles. So a recommendation that might come from this, charge electric vehicles with a clean grid, target adoption at places where um, perhaps coal generation is, is lower, uh, nuclear or renewable generation is higher. Improve fuel efficiency of internal combustion vehicles, perhaps through light weighting. Or reduce vehicle miles traveled. Ah, so that's not really within the within the domain of an automobile manufacturer, but that is within the domain of, of a consumer. So if a consumer was asking this question, uh, behavioral changes, things that don't relate at all to material choice, that don't relate at all to where you're plugging in, but behavioral choices can have tremendous impacts. And so, again, I'd love to I'd love to stress the importance of informed decision making through LCA. And you do not need the perfect data set. You do not need a system boundary that touches every aspect of society to make some of these really important, really high impact uh, recommendations through this tool. And so with that, I think that I've saved a few minutes for, for questions, Eric, and I'd like to, to thank all the participants who have, uh, who have joined our webinar. Thank you so much, thank Jeremiah. So, much. so let's start with some questions. So, okay. I mean, obviously the topic of life cycle assessment is fascinating uh, and at the same time is overwhelming when you understand how complex it is to actually find a definitive answer. Uh, but must a company complete a full cycle assessment to make informed decisions about environmental impacts? Not necessarily. So, so to be ISO compliant, there are the steps you have to follow. But if these are going to be used for internal purposes, there are streamlined approaches that can be adopted. Absolutely. And so you can um, conduct a streamlined approach that, that limits aspects of the study, that collects data rather quickly, perhaps only looks at a small selection of impact categories, ones that are particularly important to, to the company at hand. And that study in and of itself can be useful to determine whether you want to do a full proper ISO compliant LCA. Perhaps at the end of that study, you will find there are a few obvious points of intervention and you'll just get to work on those right away. And, th and that is fine and that is um, and that can be a, a really nice use of streamlined LCA. Uh, perhaps you'll find that the answer is not as obvious and you'll want to do something that is that is more robust and compliant. Excellent. So when we look at the use of claims uh, based on life cycle assessments, how can we understand if they are comparing apples to apples? Because sometimes you hear on the claims, this one is better, it's lower greenhouse gas impact. So at least that is, is, is a high level of detail because it's already telling greenhouse gas impact but uh, sometimes they just do comparisons and as a consumer, how can we understand which one uh, they are comparing? Sure, so, so a, a proper LCA will have to undergo peer review. And so hopefully at that, at that stage, the peer reviewers will identify any problems with methods, uh, identify any erroneous claims. And so if, if it is an ISO compliant LCA, hopefully the peer review will at, at least um, prevent the erroneous claims. And now when we get to the question of how can, how can a customer make informed decisions with so much information and perhaps results that look like it depends, well, that's challenging. And, and, and you'll have to um, either increase your level of sophistication. So asking questions specifically when they, when they make a claim of environmental performance, are you talking about greenhouse gas emissions or climate change or are you talking about something more broadly? 
have you undergone a peer-reviewed LCA? And um, are there are there organizations that would would certify or would validate your claims? Uh, there is there is this issue of greenwashing. Companies certainly can and do make claims that are are not founded in scientific research, uh, and and it can be difficult for customers to um, to separate fact from fictions, most certainly. And so there is a lot of uncertainty sometimes on on life cycle assessment results. So how should a company deal with this uncertainty? Well, so I th I think the the uncertainty can be dealt with in a few ways. And so I, I discussed the methods ranging from simple qualitative to uh, to more advanced quantitative results. I think one of the most powerful methods is when, when you have uh, results and you and you may make some some recommendations and some actions based on those LCA results, test the sensitivity of those results to your key parameters. If so to, to get back to our automobile example, if the Fuel efficiency is highly uncertain in your data set for some reason. Uh, test the test your results. Are your results robust to the range of plausible fuel efficiencies? And if not, why? And is it simply that there is a lot of variability in that parameter? So different consumers may drive their cars differently, yielding different fuel efficiencies. Or is it a data quality issue? And if it's a data quality issue, you can revisit and try to improve that data quality. But if it's an actual uh, variability of the parameter, if it, if it is driven by the variability of the parameter, well, that's important insight too. So, so perhaps there are ways to change, change that variability and ensure that you are, your results uh, yield the outcomes that you hope they will. Okay. And so, I, it was really interesting to see how important the use phase, the consumer part, uh, is when it comes to understanding uh, the results of uh, life cycle assessment. So when it comes to that, I mean, as consumers, as employees in companies, sometimes we don't have the resources or the time to make a very uh, detailed LCA. So what would you recommend us if we just want to have like a uh, a quick understanding of where the hotspots are, of processes that we are familiar with, you know. Yeah, so I mean, so as, as consumers, where there are, um, there's a vast literature of LCA and no one expects uh, the average consumer in, in the store to understand those results and to make informed decisions. But there are a few things that, that have, have emerged that, that um, tend to dominate results. When decisions relate to energy consumption, the more efficient option usually has better environmental impacts. So if you can choose a more efficient light bulb, if you can choose a more efficient automobile, if you can reduce water consumption per unit service, chances are very high that you are making a preferable environmental choice. Other, other choices. Uh, so some excellent studies have come out in in the past past few years about dietary choices and and what we're what we're seeing is that uh, a few food items particularly beef particularly pork dominate environmental impacts of food choices so more so than um, choosing locally grown food but choosing that dietary composition reducing beef and pork can have a, a great impact so these are some insights that lca uh, studies have shown that um, can be boiled down into a single sentence. So for the busy consumer, you can make choices that increase energy efficiency, increase water efficiency, reduce uh, meat consumption, um, some, some real tangible results from, from just those three things. Excellent to hear. And um, when it comes to trade-offs, right, the, the environmental trade-offs uh, of the different impact categories, how companies have dealt with them? Yeah, so, so if, for example, you see that your efforts to, to decrease climate change impacts lead to increased eutrophication impacts, okay, so you're pushing down on one and another, another pops up. Well, that, that's a good insight to learn. And, and so implicit somewhere in there uh, in changing your production processes, perhaps you're changing a, uh, your material choice. Well, is there the opportunity to change the production process with that new material to decrease eutrophication. 
have you have you solved one problem, created another, but created another opportunity to reduce that problem as well. So so one solution would be to be cognizant of those things and and to not only focus on the changes you're making, but the impacts of, of those changes. When that's not possible, when when you're when you're presented with a true a truly ambiguous result where you you can decrease impact A, but you must increase impact B. Uh, well, I think an, an honest look about the relative magnitude of those impacts. And so you can do normalization. So if if uh, the climate change impacts are enormous for your for your product across its life cycle and the eutrophication impacts are tiny, even a, a twofold increase in eutrophication might be quite modest. So making sure you understand the scale and the magnitude uh, can allow you to reconcile ambiguous results. The life cycle assessment is an excellent tool to have an understanding of the, the systems, to, to bring the systems thinking into making decisions. But would you say that there is a, a level of subjectivity when it comes to, to, seeing the, to making the interpretation and giving different values to the trade-offs? Absolutely, absolutely. So the, the, um, the interpretation and, and how you would deal with that ambiguity, for example, can have inherent aspects of subjectivity. What, what are your company's goals? Are you, why are you making this decision? Why are you pursuing, pursuing a life cycle assessment in the first place? And, and perhaps subjectivity into which impact categories you feel are more pressing. Uh, many people would, would consider climate change to be the most important, but others would disagree. If you live on Lake Erie and you experience the eutrophication there, that might be the impact category that you are bringing to bear when you think about this. So certainly the, the interpretation phase does introduce uh, aspects of, of subjectivity. Uh, I think it's important to be candid and upfront with uh, why choices are made. And so particularly for, for externally facing results. So when it comes to the perfect data set, and, and you mentioned that during your talk, and I see it more and more as we are talking about transparency and, and to making sure that we are accounting for the impacts alone of our value chains. So we see a lot more customers asking suppliers to provide more information. Um, what will be your final advice uh, for practitioners or people who have to handle the data to prevent uh, the company being paralyzed by the lack of perfect data set? As early as possible, you want to get to the point where you understand the impacts. And, and I think it's important to, um, to both know and adhere to this idea that you're not going to release your first draft results, but use those first draft results to inform, to inform elements of your data set that you need, need to revisit. So in that iterative fashion, as you, as you move through the study, uh, but if you never move from inventory to impact, you won't know where those soft spots in your data set are. Uh, so don't allow yourself to become paralyzed by the inventory before you, before you begin assessing impacts. You may find eutrophication is trivial and irrelevant and aspects of your processes that relate to eutrophication, you have poor data, but it won't change, change the result. And so not getting so hung up on that, on that perfect data set, don't let the perfect be the enemy uh, of the great even. And, and so, and beyond that, thinking about what recommendations you may make at the end and how that influences where you need to revisit data, where you need to conduct thorough sensitivity analysis around parameters. Great. I, I see how life cycle assessment is a great tool. I, I have used it many times. And even just the exercise of going through the process of writing down what are the ingredients of a product, uh, the processes that are used to kind of have in front of you that entire system view of what is impacted um, as a practitioner, but also as a consumer helps me make more informed decisions. So uh, would you recommend the idea of like a quick life cycle assessment when you don't have uh, the opportunity to have a complete one? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Jeremiah, for such a great talk. For everybody else, uh, continue to join us for uh, the other lectures of the Elements of Sustainability series. Until the next one.